Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in today to uh, hear my talk on the hidden subgroup problem for universal algebras. My name is Matthew Moore, and this is joint work with a graduate student of mine, Taylor Walden Sizek, at the University of Kansas. So I'd like to begin uh, first by talking about, uh, from a very high level, uh, quantum computation, uh, and that's the domain that the hidden subgroup problem actually originates in. Uh, we'll then continue with a discussion of the problem itself as well as its generalization uh, to universal algebras, which I'm calling the hidden kernel problem. And then lastly, uh, the main results which I would like to present, uh, which are namely a complete classification of the quantum and classical complexity of the hidden kernel problem on uh, powers of a two-element domain. Uh, so first, let's begin by talking about quantum computation. Well, uh, compared to classical computers, quantum computers are uh, first of all, based on a different model of computation. They're based on something called the quantum circuit model of computation. Uh, second, they're very hard or maybe even impossible to build at scale. Uh, you can build ones that have, you know, on the order of uh, around 60 to 70 qubits, but building ones that have thousands of qubits seems quite far beyond our means right now. Uh, and lastly, they're quite difficult to program and actually reason about. Uh, partially because they're based on quantum mechanics and partially because they're based on just a different model of computation. Uh, in contrast, classical computers are based on a very well-studied model of computation, namely the Turing machine model. Uh, they're cheap and easy to build. Almost everyone has multiple computers that they will use on a daily basis. Uh, and they're really quite easy to program and reason about. Pretty much uh, every high school student can be taught how to program a uh, regular computer and to begin reasoning about it as well. Uh, and they're incredibly fast. Classical computers have seen uh, approximately exponential growth in speed uh, and they're incredibly powerful now. So uh, all these points um, leads us to the question of why bother? Why bother spending so many resources building a quantum computer when classical computers are so fantastic and they're always getting faster uh, even at an exponential rate. Why bother uh, spending all this effort and making a quantum computer? Well, uh, maybe just a, we'll begin with a few observations. There are some real physical constraints at play here. We'll probably never have clock speeds that are faster than the electron transition frequency. That's 10 to the 15th hertz. And we'll probably never have circuit components which are smaller than the diameter of a hydrogen atom. That's about 10 to the negative 8 centimeters. Now, Maybe this is just a failure of imagination and we actually will have these things, but it seems very difficult to imagine that this, this will actually be the case. Uh, so what that means is that classical computers, even in the far distant future, will always struggle with exponential complexity because uh, you know, this exponential increase in speed, it really runs up against some very real physical constraints. So, okay, uh, you might have the idea that we can exploit natural phenomena to aid in computation. Um, Quantum phenomena are hard to exploit though, right? Uh, they're quite difficult to actually uh, harness and we see that in the difficulty with building uh, you know, at scale quantum computers. How about using classical phenomena? Why, uh, why do we have to go to quantum? Um, maybe you know, we could, for instance, use light diffraction to uh, help us calculate the Fourier transform, things like that. And maybe we could package all of these uh, classical phenomena together into an analog coprocessor uh, and then use that to aid in computation. Uh, well, unfortunately, classical phenomena can be simulated in both polynomial time and in space. So what that means is that the speed up uh, for doing this will be at most polynomial. Uh, so you're not really going to uh, escape um, the sort of exponential complexity bound. Classical physics uh, from this viewpoint is just, it's too easy to really be useful. Well, uh, let's instead consider quantum physics. So let's imagine a quantum system where we have n particles uh, with spin 0 or 1 uh, up or down. Each particle is going to be modeled by a complex normed vector space that is a Hilbert space. Uh, we call it this fracture B. Uh, it has basis vectors 0 and 1, which I write in Dirac's notation with this sort of funny vertical line and an angle bracket like that. The total system of n particles will be modeled by a 2 to the n dimensional vector space. That's just the tensor power of our single vector space, the basis now is going to be bit strings of length n. It's still a Hilbert space, of course. The possible uh, quantum states of the system 
are just the norm one vectors. So all the basis vectors, these are all norm one, uh, and these correspond to classical states or pure states. Uh, but there are also superposition states where you can sort of, uh, you know, smear your, your quantum state between multiple classical states. And uh, we represent that by adding together these vectors with amplitudes. Uh, and they all should be norm one uh, to represent that it's a probability distribution. Uh, in particular, the probability of observing a fixed bit string T1 to Tn when you measure a quantum state is just going to be the amplitude uh, corresponding to that basis vector. The time evolution of a quantum system is determined by the action of 2 to the n by 2 to the n unitary matrices. So if you want to imagine uh, watching or modeling the evolution of this quantum system over time, you're going to be multiplying together these really big, these exponentially big matrices. And uh, despite people looking for an easy way to do this, this is just a hard computational task. It's a task which would seem to be of exponential complexity. Uh, and so in this manner, quantum systems represent exponentially difficult computational problems, uh, which is in contrast to these easy classical systems. Now, uh, this is bad news if you want to simulate a quantum system on a classical computer. Uh, it's very hard, but because it is hard, it is very powerful if we can harness it to uh, actually calculate things. And that's the idea behind quantum computation. Uh, so I'd now like to talk about the uh, hidden subgroup problem and the hidden kernel problem. The setup for this is that we have a group G and a set, an unstructured set X, and then just a function from G to X, not necessarily a homomorphism. We'll say that F hides a subgroup D, uh, D if F is constant precisely on the D cosets. What does that mean? Well, uh, F of A and F of B They'll be equal if and only if the cosets are equal. So if and only if AD is equal to BD. And that has a nice picture here. Uh, so we can look at uh, a coset. It will partition the group G. And each one of those cosets will be the preimage of precisely one point in the codomain X. The hidden subgroup problem is given as input, uh, takes as input the group G and the function f as a black box. So we don't get to sort of inspect the definition of f. We only are able to give f an input and then see what its output is. And the output of the hidden subgroup problem, the thing that I would like to calculate is the subgroup d that f hides. Now there are some considerations here. Uh, the first is that we regard the input size as being log of the size of g. Uh, clearly, you know, we can brute force this problem just by evaluating f on the entire domain on all of g and then uh, seeing what the outputs are, uh, that's going to be an O of size of G operation, so it'll be exponential in the input size. Uh, the next consideration is that the subgroup G, D, uh, might actually be the entire group G. And so when we're outputting it, if we're just outputting it element by element, we could be spending exponential time actually outputting it. And if we're hunting for a polynomial time algorithm, we therefore need to specify this D, uh, subgroup D and at most poly log of G, so polynomial on the input size information. Now there are different ways to do this, but the most common way to do it is just by giving generators. So the output should be just the generators for the subgroup D. Uh, and groups have the feature that every subgroup is generated by at most polynomially many uh, elements. Uh, and then lastly, there are two kinds of complexity we might consider for the hidden subgroup problem. Uh, the first is circuit size, so the size of the circuit which actually solves it. Uh, and the second is how many evaluations of the function f are required to solve it. Uh, so that's the, the so-called query complexity is the evaluations of f. So here's the hidden subgroup problem again. Uh, we have the input and then the definition of what it means to hide a subgroup d. Uh, just on its face, this you know there's no reason why we'd want to study this problem, right? It seems kind of... Uh, maybe a little bit contrived. Uh, it doesn't really seem like, it seems like it's a, a purely theoretical exercise. Um, but in fact, many famous problems are actually special cases of the HSP. Uh, the first is Simon's problem. And this is significant mainly from a historical perspective. Simon's problem was the second problem historically to exhibit super polynomial speed up on a quantum uh, computer compared to classical. So uh, what's Simon's problem? Well, it takes as input, uh, or it takes the group G uh, of n-dimensional uh, binary vectors under addition, right? That's the group uh, that we're looking at. And it's just the HSP for that. 
Uh, classically, you can prove that the best you can do is exponential. So the best you can do is actually on the order of uh, brute force search. The quantum algorithm, though, is quadratic. It's a very simple algorithm. Uh, all right, fine. Second problem is the factoring problem. So given an, an integer, uh, say n bit long integer factor, that corresponds to the HSP for uh, z, for just the integers under addition. Classically, the best that we can do is using a general number field sieve, uh, which is this uh, kind of complicated complexity. Here, k is some constant. Uh, the quantum complexity for this is Shor's uh, famous quantum factoring algorithm. It's uh, more or less cubic in complexity, so it's all of them cubed. The discrete logarithm problem, uh, that is, was also solved by Shor on a quantum computer. That's the HSP for z times z. Uh, you use, again, the general number field C to solve it. The k here is a different k, uh, but the quantum complexity is the same. It's O of n cubed. Graph isomorphism. So given two graphs, determine if they're isomorphic. Uh, that's the HSP for the symmetric group on n characters. Uh, classically, it's quasi-polynomial time, so it's 2 to the log of n to some constant. Again, the k's are all different here. Uh, we don't uh, have any quantum algorithm to do that, any, qu any fast quantum algorithm to do that. So that's an open question. Uh, the shortest vector problem. So this one, uh, I give you as input uh, the basis of a Q vector space. You look at the Z span of that basis, and then I ask you for the shortest vector in the Z span that's not zero, of course. Uh, that's the shortest vector problem. That corresponds to the HSP on the dihedral group of the ingon. Uh, classically, it has complexity 2 to the k times n. Again, k is some constant. Quantum complexity is kind of complicated, but it is sub-exponential. But it's not polynomial time. A polynomial time algorithm is not known. Uh, we do know polynomial time algorithm, quantum algorithms for all abelian groups. That's due to Simon, Shor, Kitab, and many others. Uh, and then, aside from that, it's just an irregular constellation of other groups. And the proofs for these other groups are really kind of ad hoc and tailored to the, the individual groups themselves. Uh, and, well, you know, one, one way to, to get around these sorts of uh, problems or, I guess, to resolve uh, these sorts of um, ad hoc nature of the proofs is to try to generalize the problem. Oftentimes, things that seem messy or complicated in a certain domain are actually uh, straightforward and elegant in the proper general domain. So uh, in, a, in an attempt to, to get a deeper insight into the hidden subgroup problem, uh, we can seek to generalize it. So uh, here's a picture of what it means for a function to hide a subgroup again. And I'd just like to keep some questions in mind while we're trying to generalize this problem. Uh, the first question is, what makes abelian groups special? Uh, what about them is special that is so special that we have uh, nice polynomial time quantum algorithms for them. Uh, the second question is, well, the definition of hiding a subgroup, it's kind of unnatural. Uh, can we make it more natural in the generalization? Uh, and the answer to the second question is yes. Uh, and the answer to the first question, well, we'll see in a second. Uh, how can we make hiding a subgroup natural? Well, we want to extend the HSP to general algebras called universal algebras. What is a universal algebra? Well, it's just a set A together with some operations on the set of varying arity. That's all it is, a set with operations. We package them together, and then we refer to it in blackboard bold like that. So that's always an algebraic structure as a set has some operations. Uh, unfortunately, the subalgebras don't form a meaningful partition of A. We don't have anything like the Grange's theorem for groups. So they don't partition the algebra A, and it's not really clear how we can define hiding a subalgebra. But if we think back to what makes a B then group special, uh, maybe the most immediate thing is that all of their subalgebras are normal. So we can ask, what, uh, what is the analog of a normal subalgebra for just a general universal algebra? And that is a congruence. Uh, a congruence of A is just a compatible equivalence relation. Uh, what does that mean? It's an equivalence relation, so it's a binary relation that's closed under the operations. Equivalently, it's also the con a congruence is just the kernel of some homomorphism phi. So it's just like, just like a normal subgroup. Uh, so that suggests that we should instead consider, uh, instead of considering a hidden subalgebra problem, we should consider a hidden congruence problem. Uh, how, how exactly do we define that, though? What does it mean for a function 
to hide a congruence of our algebra? Well, uh, let's just try posing the question and writing down the definition. So here's the hidden kernel problem, uh, version one of it, just a proposed version. Input would be an algebra and a function f from a to x, which hides some congruence, which we'll define in a second. Uh, the f is given as a black box. As output, I would like the congruence uh, that is hidden as generators. What would it mean for a function to hide a congruence? Well, it should be constant precisely on the congruence classes. So we'll say that f of a is equal to f of b if and only if a is theta related to b. Right? That is the way that we will translate uh, hiding a subgroup. Uh, this actually allows us to impose an algebraic structure on the set x. x was previously totally unstructured, but um, since theta is a congruence, x can actually be taken to be isomorphic to a mod theta as algebraic structure. And that actually means that f is a homomorphism with theta as the kernel. So we can dispense with hiding anything, and we can just state the, the hidden kernel problem now. The input uh, is two algebras, a and b, and a homomorphism between them uh, as a black box. The output, I just ask for the generators of the kernel of phi. Uh, and you can see in the hidden kernel problem now, there's no mention of hiding or anything like that. It's a very natural algebraic problem. We have fully abstracted away the sort of unnatural definition of hiding a, uh, a subalgebra, right? We are just given a homomorphism and we're tasked with finding generators for the kernel. And that's what uh, I'm calling the hidden kernel problem. Okay, uh, let's now present, move on to the uh, results of the, the talk, uh, which is a complete classification of the complexity, both quantum and classical, uh, the hidden kernel problem for uh, powers of uh, two element algebras. So here's a hidden kernel problem again. We are given as input a homomorphism from A to B, and we want as output the kernel as generators. Now, Simon's algorithm, uh, which is really about as simple as it gets for the HSP, uh, it solves this problem when A is Z2 to the power of N, so the group Z2 to the power of N. Uh, so just sort of naively, how about we analyze this problem when A is equal to the power of a the uh, Cartesian product of, uh, or excuse me, the Cartesian power of a two-element algebra, right, when it's B to the N. Uh, well, Sort of the first question you might have is how many such B, how many uh, algebras like this are there? Well, one of them is uh, Z2, right? So that's just got binary addition. And you might imagine that your friend's favorite uh, two element algebra isn't Z2, but it's uh, 0, 1 with four area addition. So instead of binary addition, we have four area addition. Um, and I guess if you're kind of clever and you notice that the addition is done modulo 2, you can see that, well, binary addition, of course, will define four area addition. But Fourier addition also defines binary addition, right? So these are really the same algebraic structures. Uh, if instead you consider binary addition and ternary addition, well, binary addition can define ternary addition, but ternary addition won't define binary addition. So we might think of uh, the binary one as somehow, the binary uh, algebra somehow containing, or at least the, the operations are containing the ternary operations. Uh, so there is sort of a, a systematic way to think about this, and it's in terms of interdefinability, right? Binary addition defines uh, ternary addition, but ternary addition does not define binary addition. Uh, and when you think about it this way, in terms of definability, you get what's called post-lattice. Post-lattice is uh, the lattice of uh, operations, clones of operations on a two-element domain. So right here, kind of in the middle, is Z2. That's binary addition. Right down here, Underneath it, that's ternary addition. Ternary addition is below it because uh, binary addition defines ternary addition, but ternary addition doesn't define binary addition. All the other ones, like uh, four area addition, that's just equal to Z2, so it's actually equal to the same node. So a node lower down, all the operations there are definable by a node that's higher up, like that. And this is really uh, the sort of systematic way that we're going to use to that we're going to uh, Got, that's going to guide us in our analysis of this problem, right? We're going to be considering different uh, sets of operations, and they're going to be uh, sort of positioned throughout this lattice here. This is called post lattice. Uh, it was originally uh, discovered by Emil Post, um, and I believe 1921. 
So uh, here's our first theorem. Here's post class again. We say there exists a polynomial time quantum solution for the hidden kernel problem on b to the n, uh, where, well, first of all, uh, we have Simon's result. Uh, that's the uh, AP0 node right here. So that's just Z2. That's Simon's original result. That's already known. So there it is. Uh, we can make a few observations about this. Uh, first, exists is inherited up. So if you have a solution to the operations down here, since all the operations below are contained in all the operations higher up, what that means is that any homomorphism of the operations uh, higher up is also a homomorphism of the operations lower down. And based on how the HKP is quantified, what that means is that the existence of a solution is inherited upwards. So Simon's original result immediately gives us uh, solutions for these other nodes up here, all right? Uh, up here is the top. These are just all possible Boolean operations. So those would be uh, operations definable using negation and uh, join or or. So that's Simon's original result. Uh, well, we can extend Simon's result to the uh, set of operations MPT zero infinity. It's generated by X uh, and Y or Z. That's right over here, sort of at the bottom of this leftmost wing. Uh, using our observation, that actually gives us uh, a solution for all of these clones up here, infinitely many clones on the left-hand wing here. Uh, we also get it for the dual of MPT0, uh, MPT1 infinity. That's X, uh, or Y, and Z. That's right over here on the right-hand side, the right-hand wing. And again, using the observation, it goes all the way up like that. Uh, the next one that we can, can that we have a quantum solution for a polytime quantum solution is ternary addition. And that's right at the uh, base of the sort of central triangle. That's AP right here. That gives us everything above it. And now we're sort of missing just one thing. It's namely this sort of uh, bottom node of the lower uh, triangle of the lower diamond here. Uh, that's DM. That's the majority operation. The majority operation might be unfamiliar to you. Uh, what's the majority operation? Well, uh, it takes as input three uh, binary, uh, three bits. And if uh, two or three of the bits are one, it gives you its output one. If two or three of the bits are zero, it gives you output zero. And that completely determines uh, all possible values, all possible inputs. So it gives you uh, the majority, the, the number that occurs most often. That's right there, it's DM, and we get everything above it like that. Uh, and we actually have that there doesn't exist, so there are, we have an exponential uh, lower bound for the following uh, sets of operations. So there's AND, which is right here. And again, just like exists is inherited upwards, doesn't exist will be inherited down. So we get uh, the sort of left lower wing. There are only, uh, any quantum solution must be uh, of exponential complexity going down. The dual is OR, it's right over here on the right hand side. And again, it gets inherited downward. And then lastly, we have negation in zero, which is right here. And again, it gets inherited down. So every single node is covered. Uh, and this is a complete classification of, a comp of the quantum complexity of this problem uh, for algebras of this form, b to the n. How about classically? Well, uh, we get the same sort of theorem. Uh, classically, we actually have a classical linear algorithm for a lot of these uh, that uh, we outline in the paper. Um, first is MPT zero infinity. Just like for quantum, uh, the quantum situation, uh, quantum domain, MPT zero infinity does have a polynomial time solution. And so we get a classical polynomial time solution for everything above it, so the entire left wing. Same with the dual of it, MPT one infinity, the entire right wing we have a classical solution to. And same with DM. DM uh, also has a classical uh, solution. Right, a polynomial time solution, excuse me. Uh, okay, well, what's the difference between quantum uh, and classical? It's namely this uh, sort of immediate uh, diamond in here, right? Uh, we actually can prove that you need exponential complexity uh, on a classical computer to obtain a solution uh, for the uh, central uh, diamond right here. Uh, of course, because we ha we require exponential complexity on a quantum computer, uh, that means on 
that means uh, we'll have the same sort of thing for a classical computer. So we also have exponential complexity for AND and for OR over here, for the lower left wing and lower right wing, and of course for U as well. All right. So this gives a complete classification again of the classical complexity of this problem uh, for algebras of this format. Uh, so what's the situation? Here's the, the quantum complexity picture. Again, the blue means we have a polynomial time solution. The red means uh, only exponential time will do. And on the right is a classical. And if you're really good at these sorts of uh, spot the difference problems, or even if you're really bad at it, uh, you'll notice that this is the difference here. And if you take the uh, intersection, intersection uh, of these two pictures, well, this is what the picture looks like. Right? This is what it looks like. So here it is again, uh, final slide. And what's the main theorem that we can say about this summarizing everything? Well, if we've got a two element algebra and we consider the hidden kernel problem on b to the n, if mpt0 infinity, mpt1 infinity, or dm is contained uh, in the operations of my two element algebra, then we have a polynomial time classical and quantum solutions. So if the algebra is sort of contained in this sort of upper part, including the wings of post lattice, then you have both classical uh, and quantum polynomial time solutions. If, however, you're stuck in this central triangle here, then you exhibit super polynomial speed up. You have only uh, polynomial time quantum solutions. You do not have uh, polynomial time classical solutions. And then lastly, if you're on the bottom two wings or in this sort of central uh, peg here, then uh, you don't, nothing will save you. You only have exponential solutions, both quantum and, class, and classically. So this is a complete classification of the uh, complexity of this problem for algebras of this format, uh, two element domain raised to the power of n. And that's it. So thank you for your attention. And I hope to see uh, some of you in my virtual uh, question session that's uh, upcoming.